with the software, they can teach themselves to be consistent with their technique as well as their output. Um, it was just something that Harry liked about the machine, and I enjoyed working with him greatly. Um, Martin um, will run this evening, and uh, I think you call him a volunteer, and he'll, he'll run it exactly how he wants to and talk about how he's used the machine. There are other machines out the back that um, Nick here uh, is an expert on the software. So Nick Rowe, if you want to um, talk to him about the software and the utilization of that, there's machines out in, in another room that you can try and ask questions about that. Um, Rebecca uh, and Grant that's filming and myself are really running road perfect in the UK at the moment. So if ever you are interested in a machine, Grant is the person to see. Uh, he lives upstairs in the flat here and he can be contacted. And Rebecca's put a little bit of publicity together. Rebecca, do you want to say anything about what you've got over there? Yeah. There are two blue plastic files there which we've just got printouts from um, perhaps it's the Australian website which we find the most informative, which are naturally we're going to model ours on. Um, I've aggregated the information into uh, a sort of one document which is on the left hand part, which is just a summary of the background about the machine and what it's about. And the other document which is on the front is an article by Casaricas, who is the man who invented the machine and produces and manufactures this in Holland. And it's his view about why he thinks it's wonderful, which again you might find useful. Uh, there's a pad of paper at the back left uh, with a, a list growing on it. We're going to be doing an email newsletter, um, and if you're interested in joining the recipients list, please just put your name down. What's to, for you to? Sorry, can I talk if I sit down? Uh, for you to get the, the best out of this. I mean, really all I want to do is just share, or I was asked to, to share with you what I know about this thing. Um, and I don't know everything. And when I thought a little bit about what I do know, I'm not even sure why I know some of it. It just happens to be stuff that I've picked up. And any of you that have worked with Harry in the past will know what I'm talking about. If you've sat with them and you're thinking, why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? And, Sometimes you don't get it, and maybe a long time afterwards you start to, to get it and pick it up and, and realize what, what's going on. Um, just to get a quick check, how many people have used it in any sense at all? So pretty much everybody. How many people have used it with this? Okay, fair few. How many people have used, say, templates on this? Okay, and length of stroke? Okay, so just getting a sense for sort of how far people have got into it. Uh, the usual, I'm sure you've, you've heard a lot of the, the usual things about the machine. I mean, in essence, it's not that much different in basic construction to, to a concept two with the obvious thing that it moves. And I guess that's the, the bit the, that adds the extra dimension to it is that there's a lot of, there's no, more of an element of, of time involved. And you do, I'm sure, because most of you have actually seen or have used the machine yourselves or used it with your athletes, you know the, the scenario where people jump on it and it starts crashing around from end to end. And you know, for a while, people, that's the way they, they are. Some people get on it and they can just row it straight away. But it's like any other machine. Uh, you can row it wrong. Uh, you know, you can make it you can make it sit, or you can make the seat stay still and have the thing go up and down by sort of overpowering it a little bit or just overpowering the machine a bit. And I've even seen one or two people actually sit to one side on the seat so that it locks and then, <laughs> <laughs> then it definitely does what they want it to do, which is uh, another way of uh, getting over the problem. Um, the biomechanics bit, and I'm sure you're all, you know, you're all pretty familiar with that, and I, I'm not going to even attempt to give a lecture on biomechanics, particularly when someone like Tom walks into the room because uh, he, he's well up on this, on the, the whole stroke profile thing. And I, I'm sure you're all quite, I mean, I'll take it, take it in a very basic way uh, for me that you know, if, if, we were, if we were machines and we could apply ourselves to, to a boat, and I'll, let's, let's assume we did have to use oars, then in effect you'd end up with, with some sort of force profile. If you're a machine, you just go like that, 
and the stroke would finish and it would be a nice big square profile. Unfortunately, we're not like that. It takes a little bit of time to generate force and we link our legs and backs together. And so consequently, you get something that's in between or you get something that goes like that or goes like that or does something. So it's, it's, a, it's a fraction of this whole thing. <coughs> And in the beginning, when I started, I'll just tell you a little bit about why we started using the machine. Uh, I didn't actually know Harry at the time, and I liked the idea that rather than just sit there with a, with a split or with some watts or stuff like that, you could actually sit there and just get a bit more information. I knew that a force curve was somehow or other important, and if, you know, if I go back a number of years, and I'm, I'm not talking particularly far, probably 97, 98. You know, I knew force curves were important, but I didn't quite know how it all hung together. Uh, and for me, you know, when people got on it, if, if I saw a force curve that went something like that, I sort of just went, well, you know, they're pretty smooth, and da 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 and I didn't really know much more about it than that. But as I started to, to spend a bit of time with Harry, I started to understand a lot more about what's going on in the curve and as practically everyone on the, on the uh, hands up bit has used the software in a basic form, so you, you've seen the curve. And if we just take the, the very initial bit of the curve on this, you get lots of variation on that. And that was probably one of the main things that, that I started to pick up, just this, if you want, this section of the curve here, how you actually get how that comes about, or how you actually start to, to make some impact on it. So, um, a competent club oars person, you know, they'll get on this, they won't particularly crash it around, and they'll generate a curve that's something like that, and you think, well, that's pretty smooth, that's not so bad, somewhere, you know, but where do you take it to? And ultimately, okay, you want to fill it out a bit, so you want to take it into something which starts a little bit better, integrates the, the legs and back a little bit more, which is this big rounded piece, and then finishes off like that. This bit here, which we, all the, and you can relate this to the boat, and just, sorry, by the way, as we go along here, I'm working my way through almost how I learned about the thing. Please jump in and ask me questions. It's sort of I'm just almost just going through my thinking process. So if I make a step or if I say something that doesn't quite make sense, then you know, it starts. And in the end, it's, it's here as an exchange to, you know, I can share with you what I know. And you know, if, it's, if, it's not, if it's not useful or if it's not making sense, then please ask. I won't say I've got all the answers, but I'm quite happy to say. Uh, this bit. When we're, when we're actually rowing, we, and then you read about the technique of that people are looking for, and they're looking for this thing, of, okay, you, you put the blade in, and the upper body is very steady, and we start the leg drive from the legs. But you can be, start to get very specific on this machine about how you actually start the leg drive from the legs. And one of the things that we found out that influences this bit of the curve, and we'll play a bit with it later on, is by approaching the, the beginning of the stroke almost by thinking not about not just this part being still but actually almost your chords being still as well and actually almost starting by thinking of of this bit here of your leg almost swinging from from the knee so from below the knee almost that type of movement and anyone that's that sat on this machine uh, certainly with Harry and people that I've worked a bit with we quite often do a lot of work on just how to actually start the stroke, how to actually get this movement going. And it's not a hard movement. If you get it in time with the machine, it becomes quite an easy movement. So it, it becomes almost a, a thing where when the machine comes towards you, it's almost like everything stays still up here and just something happens there which actually starts the stroke off. And when we play with that a little bit, you'll see it has a big impact on what goes on. The net effect then, we almost, the way we've, we've talked about this in the past is that we use just this action to, to connect to the wheel. 
So in other words, that's like connecting yourself to the water to the wheel without actually having lost any of the real power from, from your quads or from your back. And you get this sensation when you get this right that uh, you're quite quick and loose down here to, to connect, but then when these muscles actually start to work, they become quite almost slow and strong, which any of you that have, when you've rolled, and you've been rolling really well, that's the sensation that you get. That yeah, there are elements of your stroke which are quick and connected, but then the, the real work elements where the big muscles get to work actually feel pretty slow and strong, and you know that you're really holding water and levering yourself forward in a pretty effective way. Uh, and that's one of the, the major, major things that I didn't understand on the machine uh, when I started. Uh, okay, the, after that, and we're talking about sort of once halfway up this curve, after that when it starts to, to go up, whether you get this sort of straight thing or whether you actually can link your back effectively into that is the bit where the, the rounded bit becomes quite significant. And you do find people who either hold their backs just dead still and almost punch the legs down and then, then try to open the backs. And they, they don't really work in combination together then to give you the strongest effect. It's a bit like saying if you were doing a power clean and someone said you will do a power clean by if you're standing in position, do a power clean by extending your legs and then lifting your back. You think, well, that's nuts. So it's a similar thing when you actually try to deliver your power through the stroke. And in fact, both are working together. But this bit has to start first. And I guess as coaches, that's the thing that we battle with a lot. So many people, in an effort to work their legs and back together, work their backs first. So the, the foot stretcher more or less, on this machine, the foot stretcher would more or less be staying still rather than actually being pushed. And that's then when people as well start to jockey up and down, up and down the rails. Uh, the, the, the template function, we, I started to use this thing, like I said, I didn't really, I knew it was going to be useful but I didn't necessarily know how. And one of the advantages I found was that, well, okay, you can buy the, the machine for whatever cost it is, but practically any old PC that's going to be thrown out will run the software. In fact, at this stage, in this day and age, probably the older the better, really, because the simpler it is and it doesn't have complicated connections and all the rest of it. And you can just put the disk in. So. The other thing is people then don't really feel the need to nick it because it won't uh, run the most sophisticated, that sort of PC won't run the most sophisticated games and things in the world. So you can have any old PC there and just get it going. If you use a template, then in effect the athlete can actually sit there and give themselves a lot more feedback. They have actually used that, that they're a, a template in effect, got someone to roll the way we want, recorded it, and then used it as a template. And we can perhaps take a look at that. I'm sure there are different, different questions that people will have about how you do that. And that might be a stage where it's worth maybe using some of the machines in the other room when we get to that point. And people, well, I don't know how you record a template. I don't know how you set it up. Um, can we go through that? So little things like, <coughs> like that. The other thing that, okay, in the, in the boxes that are blank at the moment, you can have, you have all the normal stuff, like whatever it says, power per stroke and uh, distance and estimated 500 meter time and so on. The other thing that, that's pretty useful is stroke length. And, okay, typically on the... So, Typically on the machine, let's say if you if you've got a measuring tape and you actually measured how far someone moved the handle and you saw that or you measured it was actually going from there to there and you might expect that then the machine will say 
let's say you measured 158, you would expect that the machine would say 158. But quite often, you'll find that the machine might actually be saying 148. And I don't think they actually set out to necessarily design it as a feature, but it's become quite a useful thing. Because the, the pickup on the machine is relatively simple, it measures when you start, when you go above a certain threshold of acceleration and when you let it off. So consequently, if you are very slow to pick up, then, or if you do something wrong, it actually measures you as a short stroke. So you can have somebody sitting there and actually be rowing quite short, even though they physically seem to be rowing quite long. And there's quite a few little tricks that, that come into that might be worth just mentioning a few as, as we're here. You see that, so I typically, I guess with the guys that I've been used to dealing with, and it does, it has been consistent with some of the stroke lengths we've measured on, say at the, the British Olympic Medical Center where it's, it's done on a concept two, where you might have a stroke length of say 160 or 165 or something like that with these guys. And sometimes they'd be sitting on this machine and it might be showing 152 or 153. And you know they're rowing quite long, and visibly you can see what they're doing. But sometimes what's going on at the front is they're, they're, they're moving, but they're not actually connecting themselves to the fan. And one of the simple little tricks with that to stop people from, from pulling into their arms is just literally to have them put their thumbs on the back and push their thumbs that way so that it actually stops them from pulling back into the fingers. You see lots of people, you can do it on the other erg as well, where they're actually doing something that they've maybe got it right out here, and then when they go to change direction, they actually do something like that. So you want the connection to be pretty steady. So you can say to people, well, just roll with your thumbs behind the handle, and actually press, press the handle with your thumbs into your forefingers. And then that, by its very nature, actually makes the handle quite, quite solid. So you eliminate that. And almost instantly, on the length thing, you'll see people lengthen out. And we'll try that a little bit later. And the same happens towards the finish as well, when people just basically lose their pressure. The machine is saying the acceleration is falling away, and it refuses almost to measure it. So you can actually to get a bit of feedback from the machine like that. Um, around the front of the stroke, so we're all pretty keen on this idea that you're out there and you just want to be pretty, pretty solid through here, not necessarily rigid, but just that you can put your blade in the water, round behind your back, as you've got your feet up under you, and that you actually start from down here rather than up there somewhere. One of the little things that we've used for that, when you can use the, the thumbs idea, helps because it, it's making people, rather than, rather than making people pull the handle by pressing your thumbs against it, it's actually making people almost push the handle away and hold themselves steady, which has the effect that, that they stay still in the upper body. Um, just to say at this stage, and there's a few people in the room here who worked with Harry, that quite often when he, the way he coached, and it certainly had a pretty big impact on me, was by almost telling people the exact opposite of what they were actually doing at the time. So people who were pulling on the handle, he actually told them to push on the handle in some fashion or other. And it's quite an interesting way of coaching. You know, quite often as coaches we sit outside the boat, I don't know, you as some athletes here as well, you're inside the boat. But as coaches, we sit outside and we just make an observation and go, oh, you're pulling on your hands. Which is what we see, and that's fine. But inside the boat, when you're actually the person that's in there, or on this machine, and you're pulling on your hands, it's like, well, that's an observation, but it's not a particularly, it doesn't give you any process to get rid of it. So actually giving people a process, it's almost like you put yourself inside the person and that idea that, well, okay, I, I can see as a coach from the outside, you're pulling the handle at the beginning of the stroke. 
So I don't want the guy to pull the handle. What will I tell him to do to not pull it? I can say, don't pull the handle, which is pretty useless because that's just so that you're telling him something he knows already. Or I can actually say, well, push the handle, keep the handle pushed away with your thumbs or with your, with your arms or whatever as you start through the legs. And that becomes quite a useful way to, to get things moving along. One other little way we did with this to, or thing we did with this to try and get people pretty solid at the beginning of the stroke was actually cross their hands over. So you could actually sit on the machine. I'm just turning my hands this way so you can actually see what I'm doing. Actually sit on, on the machine and hold the handle like this. And as you do that, gently squeeze your wrist, your wrist together, which actually makes you quite solid. So if you, you do that and you actually sit forward, you find that you actually, the connection gets pretty solid. And you can see on the left hand bit, the, the, the rising bit, and please, I'm not going to be any example of good rowing, I can sort of do components, but don't ask me to string the whole thing together, I get about two strokes and then that'll be it for the evening. Um, you can see the left bit actually goes up pretty rapidly there. And you will at times, you can see little blips and things, but see it there, it's gone again. But if I get back here and just isolate my upper body and <coughs> get myself a little bit relaxed, and that's, and the way I tend to look at that is it, I don't know if you use this term, sometimes if you start on your arms and you start by lifting your back, it's almost like you block out the thing that you really want to get going. It's like you block your legs from doing the work. And when you actually press your wrists together on this thing, it almost has the opposite effect. It blocks out your arms and stops them from pulling at the beginning. That's uh, something that you could you can try a bit. The on any you know, indeed on, on any erg. We're always talking about you know, starting from, from the lats in under here and how you can do that. And when you watch people row or you watch people erg, you see a lot of people that somehow they've got their heads down here and rather than feeling pressure down there as they push, the pressure somehow or other makes its way up here into this part and it gets in here. Then as soon as, as, soon as they try to do anything, they, they, they just get contorted. And they're not able to then sit in any sort of natural position and keep the work underneath them. The work ends up up here somewhere, which again almost blocks out how your back and legs interact. It's like you want the, the, the work to be packed in from, from here to here somewhere, but when it gets up here, it's almost like it drifts away from there and, and ends up here. And just ways of getting people to, to feel that. Having people hold it underneath, and if you, the other useful thing about the sort of position of arms and hands on this, or on any herd, is when they hold, when you hold it underneath, and you actually, well, let me see, what can I, how can I manage this? I'll get somebody. Who was my volunteer? Sorry, what was your name again? Shanta. Shanta. This is uh, really simple, but stuff that gets overlooked. And it, do you know, you heard of a guy called Tim Claren? He coached, he's an Australian coach. He does some work with Cambridge every now and again. And he coached, he coached the double that won in 92 in Bagnolis. And he's coached quite a few different boats along the way. He's from uh, UTS. Yeah, in Sydney, and he's, you know, he is absolutely manic on just how people hold the handle, how their fingers are, which I think is a great starting point. I mean, he's 
you know, I look at him, I think I find it difficult to see what he sees. Uh, but I know where he's leading, and I, I probably work on the point where he's he's moving to, rather because he's so detailed about it uh, at the moment. I don't understand it. It's on my list of things to understand, but uh, at the moment I don't necessarily. So quite often, just holding. If you hold the hand off, quite often you see people holding the hand off, and sorry, can you yeah. pull your sleeve down past your elbow, if possible? I don't see how big your arms are. <laughs> Quite often you see, if you look at Chantel's uh, elbow, how often have you seen people row by almost having their elbows out like this? So if you imagine that the hinge of the joint is, is like that, which again makes things go up here a little bit, it just makes things a little bit strange. When you put your hands, just let your hands go underneath, so hold them under hand grip. Now when she's changed her hands to underneath, the joint is now like that and her elbow is actually pointing down. And when you start to pull, you'll actually pull a lot more effectively. You can pull through here and you can also squeeze through your bicep towards the finish of the stroke, which actually keeps pressure on the foot stretcher as well. So rather than having an elbow which has sort of gone out here somewhere, not necessarily out, but even just having your elbow out there, the pressure stays underneath. Tom, do you experience that? Yeah. Is it a, quite a, a revelation? What, uh, to To realize? Change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and even just to demonstrate to an athlete, if you just sit towards the back stops and just bring the handle halfway through, just to demonstrate to someone, if you just hold the handle here, and Sean, if you just gently pull the handle against me, can you feel pressure down here? and in your biceps. And now put your hands just on top any way you like and just gently squeeze it again. The pressure isn't quite in the same place. Okay? So getting people to feel where the pressure actually is. You know, we talk endlessly about the lats, the lats, the lats. And then never really explain, well, some people don't even know where it is. I was I can't remember who it was recently I was de dealing with them. You know, they thought the lats were up here somewhere. And you know, coaching away, and it just shows it's always worth checking the language. But in this case, just with Sean said, put your hands underneath and just put them to the end. So at the moment your elbow's pointing down, what I want Chantel just to try and do. If you watch, my elbow is pointing down at the moment. I want her to try and turn her wrist over and leave her elbow pointing down. When you do this with most people, what they actually do is they turn the whole thing over. And that elbow, instead of pointing down, they turn the hand over and the elbow goes with it. And then the elbow is pointing out this way again. And I know it's a really simple thing, but you'd be surprised on the ergo, if you sit there yourself, what the difference in pressure on your feet is. And that sometimes, and that sometimes shows up on that sort of force curve where you get over the top and you get strange things sort of happening down here where people lose pressure on their feet. So with Chantel, you just sit at back stop, so just bring the handle in, right? Just relax, and just see now if you can roll your hands on top. Yeah. Okay. And now just draw the the handle towards you again. Now do you have more pressure? Okay, so she has more pressure because she's managed to keep it down there and in there rather than try it yourself. I mean, literally just sit here, open your hands out, turn your hands over and you can feel your lats when you've got your hands out. If you try to just grip your lats a little bit and then turn your elbows out and you can actually feel it shift out of there. And it just goes, all of a sudden it just goes up in here somewhere. And it's a really simple little thing. And it's just one of those little things that you, you spot. And I'm sure for a lot of crews that you've seen over, particularly the, sort of the Harry type crews, they always have this very relaxed look about them around the finish of the stroke. Just their posture, they don't have the shoulders sort of 
up here and they're just sitting there. The shoulders are pretty level. So if they're a stroke cider, for example, they don't tend to be like that. They don't have any, you know, it's almost as if they're just sitting there in a natural position. And Dirk, you've been through all that. Is that a fair? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's particularly for, instance, for somebody like myself who actually switches sides a couple of times during the training. It really, you know, at the finish, the, the finished position um, is not really much different whether you're on, on, on bar side or stroke side. There's maybe some bit of rotation to it. You know, on the shoulders, but not that much movement towards, towards the ring. Yeah. And does that thing with the elbows ring any bells? Yeah, it does ring any bells. So he, yeah, he has yeah. the He runs a lot with the sort of with the, with the under grip. Yeah. And we use that quite a bit as well. And again, on this, you can actually see if you roll some under grip, just the difference it tends to have, uh, or the difference it tends to make in the stroke. Um, Just stepping back a little bit, on the erg, on any erg, you, you roll thousands of strokes. It's a very individual thing. If you're rowing, say for us, we were setting out to row an eight. In effect, that was the project I was charged with. And in the beginning, I sort of thought, well, we've got to row an eight. And we rolled an eight quite a bit. And I eventually figured out through bad results as much as anything else that well, actually doing this is almost diluting people's physiology and is hiding stuff. So, you know, the guy in the, the, guy in the stern or the guy anywhere in the boat could be rowing at threshold and some other guy could be just having a laugh, you know, UT3. Uh, <laughs> and you couldn't, and it's not, it could be a matter of skill in that the person who's you know, rowing at that low, that low intensity just hasn't got the skills to keep up with it or you can't develop those skills. So that was why I got into this thing quite a bit, was, well, we can get lots of feedback, we can use this template, so the people who are, you know, are good at this can, can set a template up, and the people who are not very good, you can actually get here and work with them, and actually make some improvements. But as well, you can actually really be on top of their physiology. And, well, at every level it matters. Uh, I guess just, you know, when you look at the, the challenge of, row, of rowing, let's say, Say, I just, I'll just i talk about what I'm comfortable with. Okay, you're going to roll an eight. How fast does an eight have to go? Well, that's easy enough. You can figure out you know, there's gold medal speeds and all the rest of it, and you know in pretty varying conditions, various conditions, what speed you need to be. And then you start to work out, well, I need the engines, the physiology to do that, and I need the technique to do that. And of course, you need the, the psychology. And you can't afford to give anything away at, you know, at any level really, on any of those things. That's as coaches what we're seeking to do is get the best balance of all those things and go on. Uh, and that's, in a way, this was doubling for me quite a bit in that we could use it to maintain physiology as we would any erg, but we could also do a lot of work technically as well. And you've seen these things linked together. Um, you've seen the bar across there. We actually had a couple linked, linked with the bar but we also had the handles, we just had some, some cup hooks screwed into the end and a couple of, and a cup hook in the other handle and a loose spongy cord between the two of them. So it wasn't tight, it wasn't a rigid connection, but it was just enough that when someone did something weird, the other guy just sort of felt it go. And it, and it was not as solid as connection as, as down there, but it, again it was just a little idea which took it to, to another level. Maybe what we will do is just get Chantel to, to row a few strokes and, you know, I don't want to persecute anybody on this, but, you know, let's, let's see where, where she is. And, and this is how not to do it. And see what happens. So, you wanna, the other thing, and she hasn't <coughs> done it at the moment, you don't need to row with uh, the straps on this machine because the feet are always wanting to go this way anyway. Because as long as you hold the handle and it's connected to that bungee, it, they always want to go towards you. So when, you, when people jump on this and the first thing they do is strap in real tight, you get a little bit concerned because it usually means they want to, to
to risk the feet towards them. What how music? Do you, how do you, how do you um, answer the health club managers who refuse to let you use the machines without putting your feet in the straps? I'm going to Mind you, I have for the health club. We've <laughs> <laughs> got several athletes, one of which is deeply sport, obviously, but up to our local ones down in Rochester. Uh, these are very modern, very new, and using feet out as a warm up. And the guy came across and virtually threw them out. They've been warned that they must not do it. Um, I, I have no answer for that, really. I mean, okay, you have to maybe go into a bit of negotiation as to what level you're training at and yeah. that sort of thing. Oh yeah, you see some interesting stuff in, in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you've seen one of these in the gym very often. No, I just... Yeah. Right, Chantel. Mm -hmm. But don't, you know, don't, just do what you do. Don't try to do anything different. I mean, that's, just take it as it is. actually, and I think it's pretty important, if you're going to roll thousands and thousands of strokes on this thing as part of your physiology, and maybe for some technical reasons, how many people do you see rolling ergo totally flat, with no movement whatsoever on the handle, no vertical movement, the hands just go in and out, in and out. And I, I mean, I don't know, it may well be that biomechanically I haven't really looked into it, that you could generate something more that way, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and you know, I'm not, don't take me as being dogmatic, I'm just sort of sharing what I know. I don't even fully understand every, the things that I know and do. I can't necessarily explain to you why they have certain impacts, but I know from having a, a speed coach on a boat, when you start asking people to do some of these things, you start going faster. And that's good enough for me. Um, so, if you're going to do thousands and thousands of strokes, then to me it makes sense that you, well, you ingrain that pattern. You can call it sort of you know, neural pathways or whatever you, whatever you want to call it, really. You know, how many people you see sitting on the air just get their hands to the finish and push the handle out? You think, well, if you're in a boat and even if you're trying to roll square blades, you couldn't do that, could you? And it's also an important thing with rhythm when you get to the back, if you actually sit there and just let your hands go down and go out, it just starts to engender some rhythm in how you roll. And it's a, it can be as basic as that, that it's important to, to rhythm. Even if you just sit here now and just do, have your hands level and go in and out, it's difficult to actually get any sort of rhythm. But if you sit here and you put your hands down and out, down and out, all of a sudden, something different starts to happen and that becomes a useful way then of leading on to the next bit so don't worry about the handle but if you just sit at the backstop so just let your hands relax so at the very beginning i said one of the things that that i learned eventually was quite important about this machine was timing and you know chantel she, she sat pretty well and she did actually let, let her hands go down, and she did let her arms go out pretty good. But you could also see the seat sort of jockeying backwards and forwards. And sometimes it sat still, and other times it, you know, it went quite a long way. And that's the, the issue of, of timing, really. And even just sitting there and letting your hands go down and then out just means there's more of a, a mindset that you're going to sit there and begin to let the machine come to you rather than rush yourself to the machine. And in the end, I tend to think, if you've got a front stops, yeah, don't worry about the handle. You know, in, in the end, rowing is, is about going from the start line here to the finish line up there. So Chantal pushes herself that way, and then she pulls up, and if we had a really long track, we'd keep going that way. 
And it's just in my simple mind, I sort of think, well, if you've, if you've gone to all the trouble of taking yourself from here to there, then it doesn't make any sense to suddenly rush back again, even if you rush back a few inches. But if you can be patient enough to, to sit here and just gently let your legs come up towards you, and then push again. And that's you know, one of the things that I found this quite useful for. And in, in the boat as well, it's one of the things I'm doing a little bit of work with, with Paul. Uh, Paul Thompson, I'm sure most of you know. But one of the things we find quite important in the boat that, you know, it's about taking the boat and yourself down there, from there to there. So never go backwards for any reason. And, you know, it's quite a simple idea for people to get to grips with. And, you know, we're talking in the boat, okay, sit there, separate your hands out, let your body weight come onto your feet slightly, and then just let your feet come to you. And it's something that you can do on, on the machine. One of the other things which, and again, just sharing what I know, not, you know, and it can be done different ways, and, and please, please understand that. You know, you're quite welcome to, to disagree with, some, with any of this. Uh, is, just sit back, stop sitting. It's when you sit there, and sit, bring the handle back. The idea, okay, we're talking about having this separation, so we're talking about, in effect, sitting still and letting the hands come out and then just letting almost and as much talking about this machine I guess I'm talking about ways you can think about coaching people you almost can then ask the person to think well don't pull yourself over now actually just allow the bungee cord on this and you can get, give people the idea just let your hand go in behind here and just draw people forward so they're not necessarily trying to, to bundle over themselves, but they get this relaxed idea that they can just let the handle go out and then let the handle just pull them forward. Because there's enough pressure on this. If you're relaxed enough, you think about it, if you can hold yourself and be loose enough down here, then you will get pulled forward. And it's almost the same in a boat. If you think that you get to the finish in a boat and Okay, we talk about pushing our hands out and getting separation, but what about looking at, at it completely the other way around? What about actually saying, leave your hands. If this is, if we're in the middle of the river and Chantel is actually moving this way and you freeze her for an instant in time at the finish and you actually say to Chantel, well, the boat now is moving forward and you are sitting on the boat. So how about you actually just loosen your hands and let the boat carry you away from your hands. And the net result is her hands get left behind her. And that becomes quite a natural way of then actually getting people to be in time with the boat speed. So you often, you know, as coaches, again, we look at people and we go, you know, her hands don't move quickly enough. And what's quickly? You know, how do you define what is quickly? Is it a speed or some arbitrary speed or is it a speed that you know, as coaches we're looking at it and we're saying judging by the speed she's going along the water it would make sense that her hands moved at a certain speed and we just started playing with this idea well how about the idea that you come out completely the other way around and you actually go right you're moving at this speed continue to let yourself get pulled away from your hands so it's like you come to the finish loosen everything off when you let your hands down and let yourself get pulled away from your hands rather than actually pushing your hands away. So then you're getting carried away at this natural speed from, uh, from the rest of it. Okay, that's a slight sort of slight aside to the machine, but you know, I think it's, it's one of the things that affected me most working with someone like Harry, who's just coming up with all these crazy ways of actually looking at stuff. And it does make sense. And you say it to people, no one's ever said that before, and it makes perfect sense. And then the next time you're watching someone scull along, without saying anything, because it takes a while to just sort of formulate the phrase that makes sense to them, think about that idea, this whole thing, they're moving along. If you imagine that their backside was glued to the boat at the finish, the boat would actually want to take them forward. If they could leave their hands behind, then the things relate to the speed of their hands.
And similarly, when her hands go out and the body does start to come over, we have this thing quite a lot where people, you know, do you hold your knees down or don't you hold your knees down? What do you do? And the idea, you know, that she's got her body weight over a little bit. If she holds her, her knees down and she keeps coming over and keeps coming over, we've all been, we've all tried this from the other. It doesn't quite work, does it? Your hamstrings get stretched and stretched and stretched, and then when she eventually does let go, it's almost like some sort of elastic band, and you go twang and you pull together. And exactly the, when you do that here, this thing starts to go crazy. It doesn't like it at all. So how about the idea that, okay, in the first quarter, third, you know, don't argue with me, you can call it whatever you like, sort of quarter slide, third slide, half slide, that's sort of up to you, that's sort of detail in a way, that as her body comes over in that first part of the re recovery, that she just makes a couple of turns of the wheel, which just loosens her knees and then carries on. And then after that, she practically lets go of her knees and lets the machine come to her. So again, it's just another way of saying, at the finish, or in the early part of the recovery, that the hand will go round, let it start to carry your weight, just loosen your knees up, and that takes all the pressure off the hamstrings. And on this machine, you get rewarded, because then you sit still, and it comes up to you, and you start to get the feel. The other thing you can do on the machine, to get a bit of an idea of what's going on, is if you just rest your hand on here, on the foot stretcher, and literally just feel what someone's doing as they bring it up. If they've got the straps on particularly, if you're resting your hand on here, and all, so if that's the foot stretcher and that's my hand, if all of a sudden it gets pulled away, instantly you feel that person's actually pulling the foot stretcher towards them rather than letting it come towards them. And again, that's just a sort of terminology thing that you can't do. You, know, you, you do that in the concept too, and why? <laughs> it's pretty solid. <laughs> I suppose you know, if it was on the other the slides or something. But you know, it's just an idea again that you can you can sit here or you can be here, and actually, because this thing's moving a lot more, you can actually feel how someone is. I guess the, the term that we use a little bit, how someone is receiving the bow. You know, in effect, her legs are receiving the bow, and then she's actually going to push against it. And again, that's a term which, when you start to use it, makes sense to people. They're not actually holding it back. They're not pulling it towards them. They're just receiving it. It's almost like they've disconnected themselves from it somewhere in the recovery. So it's almost when you when Chantel has come around at the finish and sort of sat into this position where she's got her body over and her knees are loose, it's almost like she's done her bit and now the boat or the earth does its bit. And then when she's received it, then she starts to do her bit again. Okay, if we just try, so if you want to roll a few strokes, I didn't really look at the stroke profile. I don't, you know, don't, uh -huh. don't try it too hard about anything. Just allow yourself to roll a couple of strokes. Okay, so you can see on the pages where the, 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 the seat starts to run up and down. Just ask Sean Pell just to, to sit for a little bit longer now. Relax. And if she sits for too long, she get, it goes the wrong way as well. So it's just getting that time to sit and go. Sit, loosen your knees, that's it. So it's more gradual. You can, you can almost see the strokes where it's not going to happen. You see the ones where it has, where it sits still. And it's almost, she gets to a certain point and you can see the ones that are. Generally, it's how she just loosens her knees. And that's something, you know, maybe you see it, maybe you don't. But it's something, you know, like she held her knees for quite a long time, how she moved. Loosen your knees. Just gently. Like, that's it. And a lot of this, a lot of this, 
have to, you can be feeling like a mug doing a lot of this stuff because you're trying to learn it yourself as you go along. Um, and it takes a little bit of courage to, to keep doing that because sometimes you're not sure exactly what, you know, you're trying to learn uh, as a coach and the athletes don't, you're supposed to know. <laughs> but you know, we don't know, we, we want to learn and that's why you have to play around with it. I mean, for, you know, when she sits there now and she does stuff, I don't know why I know, but I know the strokes where she's going to go as soon as she lets the handle go. And, you know, some of you might be sitting there going, yeah, I can see that, or you might be sitting there going, oh, I can't see it. And I guess that's, that's just a little bit of experience and having made a mug of myself often enough by sitting beside someone until I figured it out. And, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to do that really. Okay, um, who's a template man on this thing? We might as well do this now just to... Just I'm sorry, sorry, who's set the template? Yeah, just what no, I'd like to do Harry is... Go, Harry okay, but let's actually get rid of that and just show, take us through the steps to, to save the template. So, at the moment there is a, a template underneath, which is the thin curve. And Chantelle just wrote a few, few strokes and that's her one on top. So. Do you want to just talk us through as you go? Okay, to change the templates, on the top you see the menus with uh, F1, F2, F3, etc. You go to Strokes, which is F3. So I press F3 on here. And what you can do, if you um, use to load a new template, you can press F9 to load a new one, or you can save the current one with F8. So if I press F9... So you see on the button, can you just step back? Yeah. And it's just, you know, F8, F9, whatever. I mean, it's actually saying here, sorry, no, do you want sorry. to save or do you want to load? And basically, you know, at the moment, we're going to... Have we lost them? Um, no, I can get it back. Right. Okay. So, if I want to load a new one, press F9. And we'll come up with all the curves that you've got saved on the disk. Yeah. Um, typically, it comes with the, the names of various fam famous people on the left, and we've put some more on there. So, so I wanted to line up. I'll just say one thing about these curves. If you look at these, they're all different. Although there are some characteristics, but there are also some pretty extreme ones as well. Like I think, uh, is it Franz Goebbels one? is pretty, pretty wacky, but you know, he was effective. And he trained on this thing relentlessly. You know, if anyone trained on this machine, it was, it was him, day in, day out. But he made it work, or he made his mechanics work you know, the way he needed them to work. And he was a single scholar. You know, all I can say is that, okay, we were in a sort of crew situation and we had a, a concept of how we would like to roll. I should also just say, explaining that, when we set out, we decided it's quite easy in a, in a crew boat to go, well, right, let's get in, let's just all roll until it's comfortable. And in effect then, there is no synergy. All you've done, at best, is just add up the individual potential and make it do something. But if you say, right, let's assume that, and it's not necessarily the case, let's assume that nobody rolls right in this boat and that we have a way of rowing which we believe is right and we work towards that. That's also psychologically quite a good thing because then no one in the boat is under the illusion that they're doing it right and all the rest of those are a bunch of mugs. So everyone's on their toes, everyone's got a challenge to, to take. And that way, then you have a potential for some synergy. And uh, what's the definition? When people talk about teams, you know, they almost spit out synergy in the next sentence, inevitably, uh, the idea that, that the sum of the, the total is greater than the sum of the parts or whatever. Well, you know what I mean. The, <laughs> the total is really... Um, and that was a, an idea that we set out with, and that was why this was quite important to us, because there is a little program that comes with this as well, where you can actually stretch and change curves around. Now, it takes a little bit of playing around with to, to figure out how to use it, and I never claimed to be a master of it, but we did play with it a little bit as well. So you could take someone's curve, and let's say it's that long, and your athlete happens to be you know, a bit 
smaller or shorter or whatever, and you could actually squeeze it a bit, so you could actually manipulate the template. You could open it up if you had a really good template for someone who was, you know, rowing at 400 watts or something, and you put a little lightweight girl on there, and she's going to kill herself trying to match that template. But then you can shrink the power of it to where you want it to be, and that's a pretty useful function. Right, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so type in the name of the curve that you want, and press return. And that's Hanging's curve. So we can see that. Interesting. And then to get back to the rowing screen, you press enter. And there's the template. So if you want to tell how rows, you'll get that curve. However, if you want to set a curve that you've done as the template, I'll go back to. Well, why don't we just have Chantal row a few well, strokes, and she should see Peter's curve come up there, yeah? Yeah. It should start to draw itself as well as. Curve. Just for example, you would have looked at it and gone, well, that's pretty wacky up there and, you know, being quite critical. But on the other hand, you can see his, his pickup is pretty rapid. This bit down at his feet. And if there was one thing, if you remember Peter sort of training at, at that time, he did so much stuff around the front. You'd see him going along doing slaps and you'd see him doing the, sitting at the front, front stops out in this river just doing the bits from the beginning and beginning. And you can see it reflected here. Okay, you can maybe criticize that bit, but you know, that's pretty impressive what he's doing there. Um, okay. Okay, if we don't want to maybe set the template or say the curve that you've done and make it the template, again, go back to the strokes screen. And if you want to set, you can press the left and right cursor keys here change between all of the curves that you've rode in your session, so we can whiz back to all the curves that Chantal's done, and it remembers all of the bits and pieces they've done as well, which is very useful. So That's uh, also a good way, if you've run a session with someone, without sort of saving everything, but just at the very end, you can just step back through the session and go, well look, you know, at about 10 minutes in or whatever, you made this change, and look at the impact it had, so it's a, and it's a good feedback from people. So we'll just pick a curve that we like the look of, so say we like that one. And again, on the options up here, space is set. That will set the template to the current curve. So if I press space, that now matches my curve. Yeah, and then I can save that if I want to. So F8 would save, and we can call that Chantal. And that's now saved. And if I want to load that and use it for another session, I can do. If we now go back to the rowing screen, press return, and you row again. Chantal is now going to follow our own template, so it should look a little bit more the same. When he went to Germany, or when he went to Switzerland in particular, and he couldn't speak German. <laughs> so the only way he could get people to do stuff was to actually push and pull them into positions. And okay, he could speak a bit of German in the, in the end, but it's almost like he discovered a way of doing things. And you know, I find it quite natural now to, to do that with people. And it seems to work pretty well to actually help get the message across. And I know, of course, there's always the issues about, you know, if it was with kids and, okay, yeah, I and mean, Chantel's a lady and I'm a bloke, but, you know, I'm standing in front of a big crowd and I can sort of... Ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> um, you know, so, yeah, there are those issues, but, you know, in the end it's about helping people to... To go fast. Yeah. What should your heels be doing? Well, I don't. Th I mean, you hear various things, and I guess Bruce, you certainly remember a, a, a period in the international rowing some time ago, where, or probably in the sort of Russians and that sort of thing, where they kept the heels down and they more or less pinned to the to the deck all the time. Is that a fair comment? Some years ago. Well, I, I, as a matter of fact, when you said what you did a moment ago about pushing down with the, 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 the legs, that was the first comment you made. As you know, I didn't reconcile with things I've identified with what you did with your crew and, and over, over recent years or further years. But I, the, the big change came in the late, mid to late 60s when 
Kyle had introduced the uh, flexible shoes and the stretchers, which of course completely changed the whole thing. And I guess, guess that was when people started to not put their heels down. So that, that certainly does ring true. I think that was development. What we're now seeing, what, what I'm getting from you this evening, is a big rationalisation of a lot of things that uh, over the years that we, we, we can remember or can identify. How do you mean? Well, it's your, I'm going to embarrass you now and say this, you, you've given a very coherent picture of how things fit together by, by describing these things, and um, you filled in a number of gaps. I've scribbled on all these bits of paper here, when you talk about the elbows, something I saw an East German junior eight doing, I think it was in 1987 in Cologne, they're doing a very odd exercise. They seem to cut out the beginning of the finish and just throw the middle half of the stroke. And they kept their elbows down all the time. And I'm beginning to think it was related to what you've just been saying. So, there you go. This you didn't want to know. <laughs> no, no, I did do that. That's where we, you know, I sort of picked up some of this stuff and it's really, well, and you can tell me it's bullshit or you know when you hear something like that you think well maybe you know we're on the right track sort of thing so it's all that's what we're here for it's useful to get these bits and pieces to your question about the the heels okay in, in, you can let go of this if you sit at front stops i think it's just give me your hands i think it's, it's quite natural when you sit at front stops for your heels to come up slightly it's almost like when you you know when you do a power clean, you're slightly on your toes, aren't you? You're not sort of, sort of on your heels. The weight's slightly on the front. And as you start to push down, I think it's quite natural that your heels just drop back down again. But, you know, I have seen, just lift your heels right up. And let your legs drop all the way back, but keep your heels lifted up. You do see people who sometimes, have seen people do that? And they put a massive, sort of, they basically have to engage this, their, their they're at calf muscle all the time to keep their heels up and it's a really, they're putting a lot of effort into doing nothing. So I, again, I think it's just a, a natural thing that, you know, when you're on your toes, and we talk about that only a lot, you know, get your weight onto your feet or over your feet or, or whatever. And oh, that's something that I've discovered that a lot of athletes <coughs> don't know what you mean. And you know, we just keep saying, get your weight on your feet, get your weight on your feet. And they don't really know what it is. They get this sort of instruction, get your weight onto your feet. And I've checked this with quite a few people and worked some stuff with them and then start to realize, again, coming about it a different way. I say, well, sit at front stops and just stick your hands out as if, if you're in the boat. And now do you agree that, that your weight is over your feet pretty much at the moment? Okay. So you feel that the, the potential to do something is there. And you say, now just without actually, just let your legs drop down, but don't let your back go back. So you get into to this position, say somewhere around here, just hold your legs. And when, when your weight is truly on your feet, okay, she won't be able to necessarily do it here because she hasn't got her feet strapped in. But when the weight is truly on your feet, you can just move, just move the slide gently backwards and forwards and feel like as soon as she wants to change direction, she can do something. Whereas if she was actually sitting up here and now she tries to do it, well, you could see that it wasn't quite the same, was it? And to me, that's an illustration of what weight on the feet is. And you know, quite often we talk about people, okay, you're at back stops, get your weight on your feet, get your weight on your feet. And people can't get, they can't, understand what that sensation is and it's just a really basic yeah come at it from a different angle well when you go to front stops your weight is on your feet do you agree yep Chantal is okay with that now just let it go back a bit and i'll just move it backwards and forwards and do you have the potential to do stuff so as she goes forward she will continue to have the potential to do something but if she sits up here and just tries to do it it's not the same and it's just a way again of giving people a bit of a sense of what it means. Yeah, you're looking. Yeah, I was just wondering if you've got any recommendations about sort of, obviously the, the height of the feet and that stuff, or is this a question you don't? No, no, I, I don't have Because obviously ask. different people have different views in terms of heights of stretches relative <coughs> to the feet and things like that, and I wonder if you have any views on that at all. Um, I've generally just, 
because we've, we've been quite keen to work on the idea of initially being able to press down, we've, we've been quite keen to get the feet under people as opposed to sort of up out in front of them. And I know you can do it different ways. And you, know, you see, I've walked around enough boats at international regattas and seen everything. Uh, but you see the crews roll differently as well. And that's just you know, how they do stuff. And, the, the Romanians rode around in their men's aid at the last World Championships, and the stroke and seven men were totally syncopated. You, you looked at them paddling, and you thought, "There's no how. How does that work?" And yet, you know, they raced really well, and they won the World Championships. And so they did something different. And the feet thing, I'm not dogmatic. I just sort of, I like someone to be able to truly get their weight over their feet, so that they can actually connect up their body weight uh, and go on from there. I mean, I'm. You know, Tell me something else, and uh, you know, I won't disagree with you. Really, I don't know how people feel about. It. I guess it depends a bit again on what people have got in their minds about how they're starting the stroke. If and I mean, I'm, it's pretty obvious. I've gone down the route of actually starting thinking about starting the stroke by almost doing that. Well, then you need to have your weight over your feet. If they're in that really high position then you, you are going to think more about actually pushing that way, aren't you? And it's just, it's just a difference. When I'm sh well, I'm sure you've all done that thing on the air where I mean, you get someone's weight, get them sitting there at the front stops and you hold the handle and you just have them sort of stand while you hold the handle and that's getting the weight over the feet. Um, right, so let's, let's get back to this. Oh, yeah. um, coming back to the heel thing, and you commented about sort of Finnish people lifting their heels up. Um, um, finish. Uh, yeah, through coming, through. coming back through to the, the other end, finish. And you say, well, people use their calves to hold the he heels up. I've had coaches talk to me about pointing the toes off the finish to help hold the finish in and, and hold a long finish. Um, and to do that, it seems to me sort of natural that you're actually going to use your calf muscle to actually lift the lift the heel up to actually keep the weight driving through the ball of the foot rather than through the the heel of the foot. Um, I'm just how, wondering how you. I would, well, it's it's a bit like the weight on the feet thing. I've yeah. sometimes struggled with that term. Point your toes at the finish. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've I found that it, it, it's helped me hold hold my upper body in a stronger position at the finish. But when you uh, say point your toes, what do you mean? Which way do you point them? Sort of towards the stern of the boat. Okay. What happens if you point them the other way? Um, it feels as though you've got you don't have the weight on the, on your feet. You're, you're sort of almost pulling yourself onto the handle. It's an extreme. Uh, but you feel, I don't fit. I've got more control here because I've got I'm able to hold on to the blade more. See, I'm, I'm not. I yeah. don't. I'm sure you can do it both ways, and yeah. I'm not. You know, I don't disagree with that. It's this thing about sort of terminology again. Yeah. You know, when you say point the toes, and coach has said that to me when I you know, rode at university or whatever, and it was just like point the toes. It was almost as as instructive as saying get your body over. It was like well, you're out there. I'm in here give me something I can use, and it's like, well, what way do you want to do Because they, they, were, they were using it in the context of sort of holding the finish in a strong body position at the finish. And they said, to help you do that, try just point, pointing your toes towards towards the stern of the boat. And Is there a lot of you've got to do at the start of beginning with your elbows coming down now, because you need to get the contact with the foot stretcher. So you can either use a cue with the heels or you can use a cue with the toes. The most important thing is to get the contact with the foot stretcher to keep the weight in the hand. And then that's where you'll see, like if Chantel was focusing on that, you fill out the second half of the, uh, the force curve a little bit really more. So it's, it, where you're trying to get to is actually to keep the connection in the hands yeah. and contact with the foot stretcher. That, that's and right. Then, no, and what that's they were trying to get was the contact in the hands. And when, you get, when you get that connection, that's the part that Mark would say. You've got the natural flow through yeah. because you've built the impulse, the acceleration through. If you time it correctly between the feet and the hands from there, the hands will come around, and that's where you get your natural your body's around. Yeah. 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 Y
guys, well, the Cambridge guys have this sort of, over the years, they've had various force profile gadgets on their boats. And last year, we, we borrowed theirs, and it actually had a little telemetry set, so you could sit in your launch or get pretty close to the boat, and actually see these force curves, so you could more or less see this. And I was amazed that, you know, because I wasn't quite sure how it was going to relate in the boat, but I was amazed at how the characteristics of people that they showed on this actually showed up in the boat. And it was almost like having seen that, I was actually then quite happy to go, well, I don't need this thing necessarily on the boat day in, day out, because I've now just, okay, it's only anecdotally almost verified it to myself or validated it to myself that what I'm seeing here is a fair view of what's going on. So again, you know, that a simple piece of kit, you know, we had this thing which is thousands and thousands of pounds worth and you're carrying all this gear out and charging batteries and you know, we don't want to knock the gates because they got these little twiddly things and you know, it was great to see it and to validate it and it does have its use and you know, I'm sure we'd all like to have one but in the absence of it I was surprised just how close this was. I could see the characteristics and you know, you strive to have something that's biomechanically sound but everyone still has a characteristic curve uh, and that's that's the way it is. It's like saying you saw Peter Haining's curve there and he could work quite hard and he could maybe get things to shift a bit but it's really difficult to really make massive changes when you can make changes but you have to constantly fight to hold on to them. Is that fair? Paul? You, it right. takes a lot of changing. Yeah, well, um, my experience We found with them doing a lot of the steamboat stuff is that actually um, a rower will adapt to the seat that they're in. So you could have a stroke seat, for example, in a pair and be uh, a lot sharper on the way up, and then put the same rower in the bow seat and changes a little bit there. Whether that's um, that's that's a pair, but yeah, you get a signature and you have to struggle to get the changes, particularly um, the gross ones with the coordination between the legs and the bodies, legs, bodies and arms. And uh, just as, as you're saying that, I was thinking, well, you know, I can, I can play around with Chantel here, but I'm thinking of myself, and, you know, no beauty when I'm sitting on this thing, but just playing with some of these things about the, the thumbs and the elbows and that, you've got to just sit on there yourself and, and play with it and see what happens. It's definitely the best way to, to learn a bit more about it because then you start to understand what the feeling is. And even here, you know, me going, yeah, do this and do that, you see a little bit of a change. It's, you know, it's like watching Coronation Street. It's, you know, it just keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you, I could, you know, I have to strongly recommend, and maybe it will be better, I don't know what's happening with the time. Where are we? Yeah, how you want to go forward with this, and, you know, we've, dealt with some questions along the way and I, I want you to, to take as much as you can and I'm at this stage I'm just sort of pressing the pause button and I want to ask you what do you want to do because I can wrap it on forever but you know, it could be useless. Uh, how did you use the software you know, or the, you know, the information to, to synchronise you know, each guy? With the, uh, with the templates, templates with the templates by actually uh, I don't actually I don't bring any with me, but I mean, we found that someone like Lewis, for example, had Lewis Attrell, the guy who wrote it for, had this really good connection of his legs and back together. So he got this bit, this sensation at the front, this thing of almost feeling like his leg was swinging under his knee. And then as he pushed through his quads and his back, he had a, you know, he didn't just have a curve that that sort of went like that, he had, he had a curve that sort of went like that. It was very particular in, in how it worked and that was one of the, the ones that we used quite a bit for people to get the hang of it. And he was, this bit here, he would describe that as uh, at, this, at this bit his, his legs just felt sort of quick and loose, sorry, legs quick and loose at this point, so it didn't feel like he was really trying to blast his legs. But when he got that right, his 
quads, so his, his quad and his back actually just felt slow and strong after that. So it was almost like you make the commitment to get this bit right and you can then find so much load through your quads and back that it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to, you don't know, jabbing and jamming at it. There's a few people nodding, does that make sense? And you know, when you've rolled yourself, when you've really got it going right, it's like you get the, you get the connection right and the rest you can find as much work as you can deal with. And, and that, that was you know, a term that he used when he got it right, this bit felt sort of just quick and loose, almost like what I said at the very beginning, you were catching the wheel or you were putting pressure onto something, but without having spent the big muscles. So when they came into play, they could really, could really push something onto it. Uh, and that, that was a pretty big breakthrough for us. And this bit is really important. It's very important. And you can, it can be done the wrong way because you can be there and just getting people to, to blast. And they can get that to happen, but then they'll, they'll miss, something will go wrong here because they've, they've just jammed themselves too hard on it. And that's one of the things that, you know, it's a pretty good indicator whether it's being done right or not. And that's where you definitely have to get on the machine yourself and figure it out. That you can actually sit there and you can actually, not, you know, the rate should be quite low, but you can just let your feet come in and you can just get this push. And that curve is almost going vertical and you realize it's not actually a big effort. It's more like a, a reaction speed or a, yeah, an anticipation, but it's not a big, it's not engaging every muscle in your body. And as soon as you start to do that, when you then feed these bigger muscles off it, everything starts to drop into place. And that's something that you know, I really strongly recommend you play with. So, sorry, so is that? Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. uh, don't did, know. Did you like, specify the strike length you wanted them to sort of do? Well, we began to find um, that most guys were rolling about 160 or so. Um, someone like Ben, who was actually quite long levers and quite sort of thin in the body, would probably roll a little bit longer on it. Um, but we didn't particularly say, we were more interested, you know, we didn't say everyone's got to roll at 160, we were more interested in, in the, the effect that Chantel found of actually making sure they were connected from beginning to end. So how they actually held the handle and how they held onto their pressure. In terms of actually annoying them when they're doing it, what percentage of your time would you be coaching them? So you say, you'd say they do uh, what, five load sessions a week or whatever it is, how much of that would you be on one chapter back all the time, just getting in right? <laughs> all of it. Answers my question. Well, amongst, so if I have five guys, I would. So probably, hugely important. Yeah, very, to be honest, it was probably when I, the more I got just tired of it, that I would actually stand back and let them do something. <laughs> and, and that's, it's difficult. That's hugely encouraging. Yeah, but it's hard work, you know, and, and that's, that's, uh, yeah, you, you can row in a natural way. And if we go back to this thing, throw eight people in the boat and just roll along until it feels comfortable and then say, right, now pull a bit harder and see where you go. Or you can demand that you're going to roll to something that you think is a good model. And that is hard work. It's like you're aspiring to something and in order to go after it, every day you get up, you're trying to figure out how do you get a step closer. And it, it's exhausting. It was all, it's almost... Because we went to the water once a day and we erged once a day, it was almost more tiring on the erg for the coach because you know, you're walking around constantly nudging and poking at people to get them to do what you want, whereas you know, you, want, you could lie down and just hold away from them. <laughs> do that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, we were very strong belief, very, there's a very strong belief in that whole thing of and swimmers have that term garbage yardage. If you're swimming like crap for hour after hour, then you're gonna go out and swim crap, technically. So if you're gonna row on this thing for long periods of time, which you know, we do and we torture people on it, then 
you've got to get everything you can out of it. And it's a shame to see people roll on it and just roll terribly, which, you know, that gym situation that you talk about, yeah. that's why I don't put the gyms. Could I? Sorry. The impression we've got from what you're saying is that you spend a lot of time trying to establish a certain points of technique and stabilizing it. And you said uh, you've got to work very hard at hanging on to the change to which you've made them. I wonder, at this distance now, was there any difference technically the way they rode the heat in the final? Or was it essentially psychological, physiological, psychological? psychological yeah. Technically, were you, there wasn't a real issue at that point. Not really. No, in fact, if you think you, you, you go to Lucerne and you do your racing, and that actually went pretty well for us. So, psychologically, <coughs> and that's something that was quite important to. I guess to all crews at Lucerne is that you leave Lucerne in good psychological shape because the next time you see anybody, you're racing for real. You know, you're racing at the world at the Olympics or whatever it is. So it's quite important that you set yourself up. And okay, well, you know, we won and we turned over the the, the uh, defeat in Henley, and that was great. Although we almost had this sort of ding dong thing with the Australians; they'd win one and we'd win one. Uh, um, you know, we did all our stuff in our preparation. Uh, technically, we were rowing really well, uh, running into the Olympics, and then we got to the point. Well, I think the guys said it themselves. We went out and we rowed. We knew we were fit, and we rowed really well. But after a period of six weeks or whatever it was, we'd forgotten that it was a race. And okay, they they made that mistake, and then after that, they were they were lunatics. Very good. I kept shortening it down and down. Uh, there was a stage where, yeah, they went and did 4K once. They literally went out up the course, down and back, because they were rowing with such intent that you couldn't let them do any more. You know, they they were rowing technically well, but they were also rowing really aggressively. And okay, I think in the repetition, I then that sort of came through. And yeah, I suppose it's a useful lesson. And people. I guess people with a lot more experience or people, you know, like the four or whatever, probably wouldn't have made that mistake. But I think that was one of the things that was really good about the guys in the eight was, okay, if they made a mistake, they generally didn't make it again. And because they were all young guys, you wouldn't expect them, or indeed, you know, me, I didn't have the answers. And Harry would freely admit that he didn't have all the answers, but sort of between us, we managed to figure it out. And we all learned a lot. Like. You know, a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about here, I, I mean, if you'd asked me two years ago, I wouldn't have had it, or in 98, I'd say, yeah, nice machine, gives me force profile, but you know, I wouldn't have known anything about things, connection lengths and, and elbows and things like that. And yet, as you said, all those bits and pieces of information are around. It's trying to stitch them into a picture which makes sense. And it's still, the only way to make sense is to play on it a bit yourself and figure it out. Sorry? Another quick thing. Yeah. You say you spend, uh, uh, everyone has their own um, force time profile, and it's quite difficult to get to change. You say you spend some time trying to change them. Can you give us some idea of your priorities for the different types of change that you're trying to make? So the beginning, the middle, the finish. You know, people approach, I, I know what you're getting at, and. People approach it in lots of different ways. And I know, for example, I do a little bit of work with, with Paul, and it's just an example. And I'm aware of it myself. I coach a lot of recovery stuff to start with. A lot of stuff. Starting with how people sit, how people, I mean, you can hear it tonight. I start how people sit, how people drop their hands down and let themselves go out. You know, you could detect that that's sort of, that's my bag, baby. Um, and Paul, coaches an awful lot of stuff with to do about actually how you push the power through. Is that fair? And it actually works fairly well in that I'm coaching one thing and he tends to, to focus a lot on the other. Or and it seems to, to work out. And you know I found if I went and coached a crew by myself for weeks and weeks that my sort of my angle would be too much. And the crew, yeah, they'd have a beautiful recovery, but they put the blade in the water and nothing would happen. So, and I, but I'm aware of that, so it is something that, you know, I know I, I work on to address it. But it just happens to be my starting point. And 
And you can equally say, well, you could start at the front of the stroke, and if you set the, the whole feeling of pressure and the release right, then a lot of the recovery will sort itself out. And it's just where you break into the cycle. And I'm sure you've all you've all played with that. There's a, you know, just looking at faces here and feeling a bit embarrassed because a lot of you've been coaching a lot longer than I have, and you know this. I mean, you know, you can say the same thing. And Bruce, have you found that sometimes you can you become almost zeroed in on starting somewhere, and then all of a sudden you start somewhere else, and it doesn't actually make that much difference. True, and I, I've not actually coached many Olympic gold medal winning crews. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree, you, you've got to have a strategy, and as long as it, you, you've got the big picture in your own mind somewhere, then which bit you tackle, I mean, it all eventually should come together. But funny enough, I adopt the same approach as you. Is that, is that what you were sort of asking? I just wondered if you could be more specific as to, you know, you perhaps um, uh, take an individual who's um, front end is quite right, you might spend a lot more time on his front end, um, and, and say, um, who is it, who is at Atrill, they've got a good middle, so what would you be working on him with? Would you be from the beginning or the end and just need his middle? We tended to, to work in themes, so we would probably work with everybody on the same thing right. at the same time. And, okay, slightly lean towards you know, if you were working on a theme of how they sat, then you might work how people end up in a sitting position. There could be eight different ways that they were doing that, so that influenced how you dealt with them. Or how people started their stroke, there might be eight different ways of starting it, but nonetheless, you had to change them all to make something happen. So it's more crew rather than individual. I mean, it's yes and no. I mean, I'm not trying to be evasive, but you, yeah, take the, begin with the end in mind. You're setting out to build a crew, so the crew thing is really important, but you have to, the individuals have to adapt to, to get you to where you want to go. I would say, for example, in Australia, yeah, we had two row perfects sitting in a tent with us all the time through the Olympics, and practically every session before they went in the water, the guys were sitting on those. And in that case, the recovery actions were really well drilled. And most of what we were actually doing, and actually some of you have probably seen this, but it might just remind me now of something else. Um, that's, I should write all this stuff down so I remember it, but sort of go through it and then eventually something else pops up. Just one of the, the other things that we used to, that we, in the late stages where, yeah, we've got recovery stuff sorted out and just sit back stops. And we were really working on this where are you getting this power from, from the legs and back? And just even just doing something as simple as having somebody sit on the machine and just gently roll with your back and arms, not with your legs. And just having, again, just having someone roll on the machine. And in our case, actually we didn't have, we didn't have PCs with us, we didn't use them all the time. Just listening to it as well, actually hearing whether it sort of just goes dribble, dribble, or whether it actually goes whoosh. And this thing makes quite a pleasant noise when it, when it gets going and starts to reflect. Like Chantelle has changed it slightly and she's got a curve with a little bit of rhythm in it. And consequently, the sound is right as well. And, you know, sound is something that's quite important on, on these herbs. Um, and just to stop for a second, and just something to throw in. Any of you that are in the, the teaching business will know this, and, but I sort of every now and again come across it and it reminds me how people learn. Everyone learns differently. You know, some people are, you know, react really well to, to visual images, other people react a lot more to sort of kinesthetic things, you know, what it feels like, and just the language they speak in generally gives a clue as to how they. You know, what makes sense to them. Um, and what's the other one? There's three, aren't there? Come on, teachers, come with me. Sound. Sorry? What they hear. Sound, what they hear. yeah, what they see and what they feel. Yeah. So, you know, you've got people tend to have a leaning as to how they want to, what's their best learning 
method and when they talk to you, if you listen carefully, you'll actually hear them lean towards what it is that they're talking about. Well, you know, when I feel this, or what it sounds like. And it's not that you're exclusively one or the other, but people tend to have be predominant. And again, you know, on this, you can see, you can feel, you can hear. And you can, when you figure out what makes a person go, you can then start to lean that way. And it takes quite a conscious effort to, to do that. And I'm quite, I've never tried it, but you can actually test people, some simple tests to see how they like to learn to do things. And it will be interesting with rowing people to just check on that and see. Because I know, I was working with Paul one, uh, not too long ago, I, I was coaching Gwyn, and I said something to her, and she was sculling along, and it started to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And I started thinking, well, I was, it's what I've said. And you know, I chatted to her afterwards, and, and she went, well, I was just doing what you asked. And she was doing exactly what I asked. But you know what I was seeing, what I was seeing in my mind, and what I was saying weren't quite exactly the same. But she was doing what I asked. She was receiving it the way you know she needed to receive it, and I was saying it the way I thought I should say. It. But in between, I was totally the wrong message. And you know, by the end, she was rolling like rubbish, and it had to go stop and almost you know, go. I forget about what I said and let's start again and see what happens. Sorry, you're gonna. No, I just wonder if you were visual or whether you. And done that to one of those three, or you just want to be more in your own learning stuff? I'm probably more feeling kinesthetic now than I used to be. And that's probably come from, probably with visual. If you think about it, when you're a coach to start with, and people are trying to get you, you know, you're trying to develop yourself as a coach, you look at people and you're trying to figure out what's wrong, so it's, it's a very visual thing. And then hopefully, when you move on, it becomes more when you put yourself inside the athlete, it's a much more about what the athlete's actually feeling as they do this. Is that, does that make sense? Tom, you skull a lot. Is that, you know, have you found that when someone is coaching in those different ways, what yeah, they say to you? Yeah, I mean, different coaches definitely come out of different styles. I've always felt good when people talk about feelings of what muscles, how, you, how where you should sort of feel the connection first, things like that, and that's I think Harry was very much that was the use of talking yeah. about feelings and <coughs> things. I think, I mean, I've just started out coaching, but I sort of go with the coaches that have worked well for me, like, and, and what I've sort of changed as I've made. So I will start, sort of start doing that, and then I'll be coaching someone, and someone will make a massive change because I've sort of sat there and gone, just make it feel like this, and they go, oh, when I did that, that was it. And so then I sort of learn that talking about feelings to this guy doesn't make any difference, and me sort of showing him kind of, Positions I want to get into makes so that's a visual. Changes. Yeah, thing, yeah. But then, like, say every athlete works different ways. Sorry, I don't. I slid off down another side track there, but you know, I think it's pretty. It's an interesting thing to to think a little bit about. So we had Chantel just rowing, just with her back and arms, and just getting the feeling of this sound. And that was something that you know, when you're right at the very end, you can be focused quite a lot, and you want to be developing power. You week of the World Championships or the couple of days before the boat race or whatever, you're not you're talking about how you hold your elbows and stuff, it's too late. You're talking about how you can really get it to go now. And certainly if you watch boat race, if you watch Cambridge of the week before the boat race, you'll see a lot of in the eight, the eight sort of zigzagging down the river as people on various sides roll and really get the power on through their backs. I don't know if you used to do that in your Thing. You used to do it in a pair, and certainly a famous piece of video of you, Dirk, in uh, Banyolas, <laughs> being harried, <laughs> yeah, yeah, rowing in circles, but you can do that in an age as well, where you've just got one side rowing and really getting this thing going. And just starting that here, by getting someone, just Chantel rowing with, with her back and arms, and just getting that feeling going, so do you want to just try to do that again? And, I mean, you can, again, just watching her, the whole, she's pretty good, but she can do the thing with her thumbs here again, and just almost the feeling that she's actually pushing the hands off that way, and she actually starts to lean back, gives you a smooth connection to the hand, but we're all going to pull back. And when you, you know, 
you say to Chantel, if you hear the noise, Chantel, I want you to keep the rate the same as it is, but I want you to make this noise even louder through the middle. Through there. So can you do that for me? That's it. Just keep it steady. Loud. And we fill that. One to five. Two. Three. And out on the fifth. Just basically let it go and roll. Keep rolling. So she's just worked a bit on how her legs are back and connected in an isolated way. <coughs> and then bring in her legs. It's only a very small change, but you can see that she's actually, she's not rolling at the same maximum force, but she's actually bulked out the top of the curve a little bit, so the legs and back thing has taken a bit of an effect. And it's a bit like you were talking in sort of what you worked on, the components. You know, a few minutes ago we were talking about something here, and now we're talking about something here, and Paul mentioned a bit about what we were talking about, pressure in the feet and the elbow stuff, which has an effect out here. It's almost, what you're saying, a lot of it is experimentation really, isn't it? And it's almost coaching what you get a result from. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been, in a way, having a simple approach that makes you go fast. <coughs> and if you figure that out, then that'd be the thing to do. Mm. And it, you know, that, in a way, okay, I used that term by accident, there was components. That there was a component of how to pick this up. There was a very simple component of how she would actually get her legs and back to work. And you can sort of just play with those two things in one session. And you get her going up here and you get this extra bit of bulk and you get this thing sorted out and it's you're manipulating it there and then. It might be worth just going through <coughs> with your force curve what you're actually trying to look for there because it's obviously the area under the curve is is the force that's being applied. But if you've got your triangle shape so it's the length of stroke. Go on. Uh, so yours? No, no, please. Well, obviously your length of stroke is important, and um, because if you, you start getting your your uh, your TP shape, uh, it just becomes physiologically more muscular at the top, where really all that matters is the so area. It's the total, it's the it's the total of getting that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to exactly. If it's the area under the curve. Yes. It's pretty costly to generate this maximum force, whereas my work is the area under the curve. Yes. And so yes. this, and that's, and that's where Martin's connection, and then back and legs is, is vital to make sure that you build out the second half of the stroke. And you can see, I don't want to pick on Chantel, but you can see how it just drops off a little bit there. Whereas if the back and leg, we've got a bit more coordination when Martin I just had talks for the next month and we come back. You'll <laughs> <laughs> see that, that built out a little bit, little bit more. So you can actually lose a fraction at the top, but you get it out over the whole stroke. And then when you want to build up in, in, in force, you go a little bit over the whole, the whole curve rather than trying to throw your bollocks off. And get it well, that, that was something that we found. You know, there were a few individuals who, whose natural thing was a little bit peaky. And there were people who had their backs held in very strong positions, but it was almost like there wasn't, they held the power, but they didn't do anything with their backs. So their backs just were rigid and moved, but they didn't actually deliver power. And it was quite, it was something that I was, when um, we were in Australia, that rowing conference, that um, Valerie, the Valerie, wait, Kleshnev, who works at the AIS, is Mr. Gadget in terms of rigging up, rigging up boats and all that sort of stuff. And he came up with some of these curves where they isolated the stuff. And it does tie up with this when he said, uh, yeah, what percentage of power? We had a system that uh, was done in the boat where you measure how much your legs were contributing, how much your back, and how much your arms. Um, tell happened. us what the results were. Well, it varied for each person on, on what their size was. But you could even, in fact, get rowers that had like a negative someone takes a stroke and then you straighten your arms during the stroke and so that their arms are actually giving a, a negative force to the uh, they ended up putting a silver medal at the Olympics and sitting with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you can actually produce a negative a negative force with your
drafts. And so, again, it's one of those things about you know, feet height or seat height, but um, you know, you certainly want the contribution from the legs and, and, and how but they're put together. The back, it transmitted a massive amount yes. of power. Actually, on some of the stuff yeah. I saw, it, he it was more his, than the legs? Yeah, he did his PhD on it. And, uh, and <laughs> he did a PhD on it. On how much you back the contribution that you back in your legs during the rowing strikes when he was with the Soviets. And um, yeah, he thinks that we don't get enough out of the legs, but that connection with the body coming up and, and that it should be more extreme than what most of the crews do. What about so you're trying to trying to hook the back up? I mean you see some athletes who really you know hold the legs and then do that or you're trying to do that like they're doing the ninety two double type thing. Personally unfolded over and So, I mean, it surprised me. I mean, you're saying something like 45% of the power of the stroke was coming through your back, and about 40% through your legs, and then the rest was yeah, the, the arms. Yeah. Uh, and that was quite a, a revelation. And if I think about, yeah, if I relate it to, to the experience that, that we built up, like doing the stuff before people went out to race, really getting their backs going, and then letting the legs come in. It did have that effect of really rounding out that curve, and there were people, you know, who would sit on the earth and generate lots of maximum force, but to try and generate the, the same power as, say, someone like Lewis who was rowing this, they had to kill themselves, and you know he would be sitting there with strong strokes at whatever rate, and these guys would to, to row the same rate would be appear to be moving really quickly and getting this sharp force, but. And if you come back to that feeling that when you get this right, your legs and back actually feel strong and slow, that's where that feeling comes in. Whereas when they feel sort of quick and fast, it's actually the wrong way around. Uh, and that's, that's quite a, a point to, to pick up on. It, it can also be, you know, quite, it can also be a sort of a real physiological sort of strength thing, you know, in which body position people have got you know diff different amount of, of strengths in this in their in their lower back and, and, and upper back. So you know, if someone is evidently doing something strange with their path, if you might actually sort of have to do this to start like a year sort of earlier, somewhere in, in the gym over a very long period of time, because otherwise you may actually force people to row to a pattern that, you know, lots of little muscles and joints are, are not used to it before they know what they well, you know, if you take go. That Pretty much exactly that issue with somebody like Lewis has had a serious back problem and for four years probably did massive amount of core strength physio work in order to keep that under control but you know, the, the, uh, the net effect of that was that he had it's not so much a strong back as a strong core isn't it because Rowers have a strong back. It's, in fact, it's because they have strong backs that usually causes the problems that they've got strong backs, but the rest of them is like a piece of jelly. Uh, and you, you know, sit-ups by themselves aren't necessarily the answer. There's a lot more to it than that, We're talking about deep muscles and all that sort of stuff. And you know, when he addressed all those things, that really made a big impact. And we recognized that exact experience in him pretty quickly and realise just how important it was for everybody. I mean, everyone talks about it, but you know, it got to the point where everyone in the crew knew they needed to be doing it, and they were doing it, and it was having an impact. Because again, you can't you can't hold it really solid through that through that this whole corset. You can't you can jam your legs as hard as you like, but if you can't hold on to it, then that power doesn't get transmitted, which is almost like what you're saying about cross-country skiing. You you let go in some fashion, you get slippage. It's not slippage on the blade, it's slippage in your in your body almost. Is that, uh, sorry, yeah? Uh, just a quick question. The, um, did you do your testing on these machines? No. You mean the 2K type test? No. no. Sort of stuff. Um, because the standard uh, was to do it on the other machine. Um, and that's... I'm, you know, it's, a, it's a moot point, really. You, it wouldn't bother me you know, if, if uh, somebody said, "Come along and be chief coach of such and such a team tomorrow." And it wouldn't bother me to make this the standard because there's an extra challenge in it. But you know, there's, there's pros and cons, and that's if you want to participate. <coughs> the, um, 
crash B, ergo sprints or whatever, then that's it. Although, is there a, an international competition for this time? Not yet. <laughs> yeah, well, they do them in, uh, in Holland, but they have a chance because uh, Can you imagine some guy from your local gym getting on this to do his 2K? <laughs> and yeah. 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 walked himself out the door <laughs> by halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Anything else? Come on, you know, it's, it's for you, so it's intriguing. Drain everything you can. Yeah, Pete, Pete Haining's curve, presumably that's, that works. I mean, it must be a reasonably effective one. Um, but it had quite a sharp kink in it. Is there any. Yeah, he had a, he had a thing that, my memory is right, it was actually quite impressive on the way up, and then, okay, just making it a little bit more. It's sort of did something like that then, didn't it? Yeah. So that would, if you think about, I guess, visually how Peter sat, he did actually sit quite upright, didn't he? And he, he appeared to have quite a fast back, which would actually tie into that. So he was actually good, very good with his legs, but then maybe he wasn't able to hold as much through his back. So just thinking about how, we, remembering how he sculled and that, that probably doesn't, that doesn't surprise me. But then you, there's one of, uh, do have, where's that? Uh, okay. Yeah, do you want to pull up some of those other ones? Just worth looking at, might be. Do you want to see what you Sorry? Oh, I don't know, um, Chalupa? <laughs> So um, that's Chalupa, and that's a pretty, pretty. Stuck. Okay, I guess these guys when they get on this machine and they know someone's going to record it, they make a point out of making it quite strong because uh, it's there for uh, eternity. Um, but that is pretty. That's a pretty decent curve. Although, is that stroke length for real on there, or is that a? That's Sean Taylor. You know, you, you can't, you can see he's obviously, he's got, a, his legs have moved pretty quickly and he's held his back pretty well, but you can then see it is a little bit rough down towards the end, so he, he has probably yanked on it slightly and as it's come towards him in an effort to really keep it going, he's almost got it and lost it, got it and lost it, sort of degrees as it's come towards him. Um, but again, you know, he's... Well, when these templates are made, are they just a single stroke? Or are they um, averaged out for, I don't say, over a set number of strokes? They're just single snapshots, aren't they? It's just yeah. single snapshots. It's one single stroke. You can't manipulate the stroke. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If no, you're no, when you were making a template where you took it over a, a particular period or a particular number of strokes so that you get a... If you're a really... A uh, if you're a really clever clock, you can import it into something like Excel, yeah. average it out and pump it back out again into an average curve. Don't ask me. I'm not doing that. I'm sort of. I'm not sure. You know. Yeah, you you question your point valid, but and it yeah, can be done. I was just wondering how, if you like, true to race situation the templates might be. If we're doing it as a, a single stroke. Well, and then the person yes, is rowing, the so they're yes. being pretty consistent. And you know, when you see them row stroke after stroke, you get a pretty good idea of how reliable mm. their stroke profile is. But as you said, you know, sitting on a machine now it's going into a template, you might get a slightly false picture. Well, on this and that, you might take 200 strokes in a session. You can go through the strokes by pressing left and right. If you hold down the arrow, they'll whiz through very fast, and you'll be able to see if there's huge variance, but it's quite a good average all the way through, or eight, if they've been consistent. And therefore, it should be quite safe to take one curve. If it does go wildly, then you probably want to do another session and get a little bit more average. I mean, it's just, it's like any tool or device, and you can abuse oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah no, no, I was just wondering how, how it was set up. It, it will just take one stroke. So, I'm, well, I'm grab, actually, is the, uh, so, that was a good goal. Yeah, yeah. If, if I remember right, it's a little bit weird. Mm. So it's quite different. So you can see that there was quite an effort to, to get something happening towards the finish. I'll be honest, I've no memory of seeing the guy's skull, so I can't reconcile it with how he sculled. 
think he was very, very upright in the game. Okay, so, so again, you would say that, I mean, I'm only, if you say that, that's probably... Yeah, I saw him in Holland about three years ago, so it's possible. Yeah. So, compared to, to Chalupa, Chalupa kept his back connected to his legs, or his legs connected to his back, quite a long, you know, rounder at the top here. Whereas from what you're saying, he sat more upright, which is a bit like the sort of Peter thing, mm -hmm. and that's that's a variation of what Peter what Peter's is like in a way. And then, like you said, towards the end, he he pulled on it quite hard. So yeah, if if people remember what he's gone like, uh, it it does. You know, after a while, it, it is a fair reflection of you realise it is a fair reflection of what people are actually doing. And it, again, it doesn't mean it's you know. He almost did pretty good. Um, but again, you, I suppose you asked the question that if you could, without taking away the, the speed or the, the natural ability that someone has, if you can slightly shape it to something that people are agreed is biomechanically more efficient, would it make them go faster or not? You know, it's, it's like saying if Matthew Pinson didn't pull on his arms at the beginning of every stroke, would he go faster or not? I don't know, he goes pretty quick as it is. You know, I wouldn't be the one to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's that's the truth, yeah. isn't it? You know, you it's all you got to take it with a pinch of salt as well. I mean, it's, it's great. It's it's a great tool, and you know, from my point of view, getting information from wherever you can, saying, well, if you're going to take a bunch of guys with a dream who are willing to work hard and. You know, they're not sort of 540 ergo guys, they're 550 or 6 minutes, or which in international terms, you know, is slipping towards the average. Then you've got to look at everything in order to make it go fast. So you've examined the system in every way possible. And that goes, you know, about what they think, how they eat, how they sleep. Everything is a contribution to that. How they grow, and you look for every possible tool. And if we, we could talk for days about every different thing food diaries guys did and all sorts of stuff you know, we got up to something you know stuff which i don't think most people even know nothing wrong but you know we looked at everything little things on our blades and fins on our boat and all that sort of stuff it's not a secret or anything it's just that we did so much stuff and we never really thought about being a secret weapon it was just part of the attention to detail so, um, yeah, and uh, grab someone else there, Greg. You know the skill is in it? Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Van der Zwan, who's he? He's the, uh, he's a Dutch guy, isn't he? I think he might have been in the Dutch 8. If I'm... Was he? I think they're all scholars in there. Well, they're all, yeah. I mean, okay, look at it. It's, it's not, uh, it's not. It's, it's pretty pretty good. You can see there's something here, and it, it's fairly opened up, and it keeps it pretty well. But you can see there's a little blip there after he's picked it up through through his feet. There's a little slippage there. Okay. Um, okay. Fire questions. Are we done? Or yeah, whenever you've had enough, you've had enough. So it's not meant to, it's not a, it's not class. Okay. And I hope it's of some, some use, you know, about the machine, but also just thinking a little bit about how people learn and what sort of terms you can use and playing around a bit with that. Just being a bit aware that it's very easy just to go out and coach people in the way that you feel, in the way that you coach, and not actually be giving them the message in a way that they can do something about it. So, you know, that's, that's, in the end, that's what we're there for, is to help them go fast and, and enjoy them, seeing having them, them uh, having some fun. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you for a really good, brilliant evening. I've learned so much more tonight than I would possibly have thought that I was going to learn. And uh, I know that I'm going to be training on that uh, very machine a little bit more than I have done today. Thank you very much for coming down.